So for those of you who have, that just joined us um, in the main session um, and listened to Judy, um, it was a, were you there, Peter? Yes, I was. Yeah, yes. Tim, not sure if you saw it either, but it was a, um, yeah, sorry. yeah it, it's, it's just a beautiful, I think, place to start around mm -hmm. heart and um, heart-centered work. And so hoping we can weave some of that into this chat to just stay with that, that focus. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, it's so nice to see so many people um, that have joined us today uh, for this chat. I guess the, the purpose of um, our session is, um, for those of you that know the way I work, it's going to be an organic discussion, I think. Um, but it's, it's really dependent on um, you asking questions and giving feedback as well. Um, so if you do want to use the chat box, um, it's just down the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can either send private messages to us if you just wanted to keep a question private um, or to the whole group. And that way we can sort of have a really engaging session or else we'll just be talking to each other. Um, Peter, I've lost your video. Have I, are you still there? I am. Can you hear okay. me? I've got the death wheel spinning on my screen. You know, that little wheel when you're lagging. I know it well, because it always pops up in the worst, worst times actually. Mm. Um, but I can hear you, so that's that's the main thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've got a great head for radio, Anna, so not seeing me is not a bad thing. <laughs> um, so let's start. Peter, I'm going to throw to you. I want to start um, for the 100 people in this room. I think um, one of the things that might be helpful is to, in a non-process um, um in a non-process way, have a discussion about actually the birth of the ECEI partner approach, why we were all came together back in the day um, to design something unique for early childhood. Um, and for this session, really keen to sort of take us on a journey from our initial vision and all of the heads and hearts that were together in mapping that, um, that North Star, um, maybe talking about if we've maybe veered away or sort of shuffled around the North Star and what we need to do um, to all come together across the country to deliver um, something pretty phenomenal. Um, so can I throw to you? This is the handball motion. Okay, thanks, Anna. Look, um, it, it, they were interesting times. We were, we were in a period that um, was probably unprecedented in many ways where the, the, the then agency was, was still in trial. It was still, if you like, sorting out its own, its own sort of role and its own sort of, um, you know, for want of a better, infa better word, infrastructure required to run something as, as, as bold and as big as the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And I think uh, when I came to the agency um, after 10, 12 years in New South Wales and a bit of time in Victoria in, in the early childhood world, I noticed that they had immediately fallen for the, for the rookie trap of thinking one size fits all, you know, naught to 65. And it's, it's, it's great that Tim's here today because it was actually some words that he spoke in Perth on two, in 2012 when the scheme was first envisaged that sort of inspired me to start to think about, well, what is the world gonna look like when the states and territories vacate this space? Because they, through their, through their agencies and through their own um, professional staff had played a very big role in early childhood intervention in Australia. The policy, the program setups, the way they funded, uh, the way they supported the early childhood intervention sector, particularly in Victoria, but also in other states, had taken early childhood intervention on a journey uh, over the last 25 or 30 years. And, we quickly identified yourself, myself, I can remember the little posse, Vanessa Robinson, and a few few others, quickly identified that we needed to really start to, to, to develop that North Star, that, that vision of what we really wanted and what we wanted to keep. And the words that Tim spoke in Perth in 2012 were, well, what does a respectful national disability insurance scheme look like for a two-year-old? What does it look like for a family that is is, is probably just still um, in the euphoria of having a, a very young child and finding out that that child has additional needs. And the concepts were that the 
the key ingredients to all of what was successful previously was high levels of collaboration, a clear commitment to the vision, and having different parts of the system working uh, to ensure that none of that, none of that dissipated. And what we saw was that um, the NDIA in scaling up to where it is today, so we're, we're five years on, where it is today was going to mean that there were going to be higher priorities and higher sorts of pressures on the agency to stand up the NDIS and probably not really build what states and territories had built in early childhood intervention in their jurisdictions. And by that, I mean, different states differed in different ways, but all of them had very active government agencies in ensuring that, you know, the right conditions were, were, were in place to ensure the better practice early childhood intervention, family-centric models, strengths-based conversations were all central to this. So the North Star was quickly established as, well, who can best help us to do this? If the state and territory governments are exiting this space, how do we build that leadership? How do we build those people that can recite the North Vision, or the North Star, the vision of what we need and become the leaders that would take the baton from those that had done it in the past? So I suppose the partner uh, role is best described as being very, very much uh, the fabric and, and the leadership and the vision holders of early childhood intervention in Australia when we went from eight systems to one. Now, that's very easy when it rolls off the tongue, Anna, but uh, everyone was coming from a different place. Everyone was, uh, you know, every, every jurisdiction had different complexities. You know, Queensland was a very small, not for, uh, in a, a very small private market government with a ma major provider. New South Wales, it was about 50-50. Victoria, it was very different. South Australia was very different. So in the rush to stand up the scheme, I think what we've lost is probably that vision um, a little bit. And I know the agency through the Early Childhood Services branch now is very committed to, to really starting to, re, to, to, to refocus our partner efforts to ensure that we're delivering the vision rather than just the schemes, uh, the schemes sort of processes. Yeah. Can I just can I just stop you on there to go? Um, and I'll, I'll throw to Tim in a second. But wondering with the with the reset or the NDIA's sort of approach at the moment to looking at how the ECEI partner approach is tracking. I mean, just going to your point around the starting place, the starting points for every state and territory was so vastly different. Not not only about who, what government was overseeing early childhood supports at the time, but also the view of um, children with disability and developmental delay as well and where they sat. And so um, maybe it's a question for Tim as well, but wondering in, in the reflections, I mean, one of the things I think is just rapidly rolled out without, without us truly understanding the starting places for each state and territory. And we haven't had a conversation about that, which makes us frustrated and makes it seem... Um, so unbelievably um, complex um, and but we actually haven't got that deeper understanding about where everyone is coming from and I think until we really understand the starting points how do we then move from there yeah look I'll, Tim, I'll, 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 I'll throw to Tim in one moment on this but if I was to put two two sort of two streams of consciousness back to you on that Anna the first one is um, we need people and here I am going to say that the partners have a, an instrumental role. We need people to, to champion evidence-informed best practice early childhood intervention constantly. And I think all of our partners are very capable of doing that. It's just we've probably got them tied up in knots doing other things and we have to refocus their efforts to really pick that up. And I think the second thing I'd say to you is that, you know, we probably have got... Um, an opportunity also because in early childhood intervention, there are three sorts of really, really important conditions you need to, to create. One is high levels of collaboration. One is, you know, support for the, for the child and the family holistically. And the third one is that 
you you uh, focused on um, you are focused on the child's developmental trajectory, not just specialist services. And I think we've sort of lost the way a little bit in the NDIS where we're focused more on the specialist stuff and not on the holistic approach. So the conversation's got to be restarted and rebooted, Anna, and, and, and I think the agency's now moving to that. And it will have different nuancing in different parts of Australia and it'll have different challenges. But I'm sure Tim's got an insight also he'd like to share. He's got a whole bookcase, so I'm sure he's... Yeah. Um, my take on this is that, um, uh, you know, if we start thinking about um, early child intervention, we had a vision back in 2012 and before then of what the aims were that based upon an understanding of how children learned from the environments in which they spent their time, what opportunities and so on they had, and therefore the critical role that parents and other caregivers had um, and so our core goals were building parental capabilities and providing them with a, a range of um, experiences in community and other environments. And that was the driving vision, at least for um, the, the uh, you know, possibly a vision that um, might have been stronger in Victoria, I don't know. But um, we recently um, were commissioned by the Department of Education in Victoria to review what was going on because they were concerned about the impact that the NDIS was having on early childhood intervention services. And the first question they asked was, well, is that vision still right and are the best practice principles still apply? And uh, reviewed the evidence and the aim is still valid, um, best practices still apply, the job is still principally building parental capabilities and ensuring that all the environments in which children spend their time promote their functional skills to enable them to participate. And the Education Department of Victoria also commissioned us to, sit to survey what was going on. Um, and um, we did that. Uh, and a number of you, number of um, partners will have been involved in that. It would have ended up being mainly uh, Victorian and Tasmanian partners rather than Australian because of time constraints and money constraints and so on. Um, that report has not been released for reasons that I can't, uh, that I don't understand. Um, but it doesn't paint a, um, a pretty picture really. The principles of the NDIS are not in question, um, but they are not currently being fulfilled. And that does not necessarily appear to be the fault of partners as such, but of the way in which the system is um, funded uh, and so on. So there are perverse incentives for parents to end up choosing programs which are not based upon best principles and so on. And there is inequitable service delivery so that the most um, best equipped people, parents, are able to get the most money and to get services quickest. And some families are opting out of the system because it's all too difficult and others don't have proper choices at all, etc. You're all familiar with these kinds of issues and they are um, by and large not of your making. Um, so the system does need to be, as Peter says, rebooted. Um, I've got a list of things which I think um, are about um, both what I think partners can do and the, the direction that overall we need to take to, um, uh, you know, to. Uh, in the direction of the North Star, where do we need to go? So, um, Anna, okay, if I just do a quick half a dozen dot points on what I think partners Hit can me. do. Yeah? Yeah. Um, remember, you're a partner. That's your title. And uh, to me, that is what the kind of relationship you need to be seeking with parents. And that's hard to do, but it's so important. Um, I would um, 
focus on the needs of the child, parents and the family as a whole. Uh, that's extremely important um, because um, there is a, a drift um, because of the way that the funding is um, uh, run and so on. There is a drift to focus on the child only and it's a struggle to get parents to focus on themselves and the family. So there needs to be work done to refocus there. We need to help parents understand their role and its importance. Children learn most from the environment in which they spend their time. That's the time they have with the parents. Parents need to understand that as the fundamental of what's going to benefit their children. We need to help parents focus on outcomes, not on services. They don't need speech therapy or physiotherapy. They need the help of a speech therapist or a physiotherapist to achieve certain outcomes. That's a fundamental difference um, that refocuses the whole conversation. We need to help parents think about what they want from the service provider. Not a service for their child, but guidance to themselves on how to build their own capabilities to meet their child's needs. And um, I don't. I think you, um, the business of developing a plan for a child is best left to a service provider. Sort out the outcomes, by all means, with the parents, but leave the plan, uh, getting a detailed plan for the provider. And I think also helping parents think about their involvement in uh, their child's involvement and their family's involvement in early childhood services and community services and the importance of building links with local um, services and community services. If parents come to you with their demands already worked out, there's a, a challenge that people, partners have said, um, happens that people come having been uh, uh, having been captured by services or having been persuaded by something they've learned that they want a particular thing and the question is do we give it to them um, I wonder if if we think about a doctor and a doctor um, does a doctor automatically give you the drugs that you think you want or uh, the treatment that you think you want you might not have been have taken the Hippocratic Oath, but I think we do have owe an, an obligation to parents to ensure that they are um, equipped with information. So I think we've got a job to do to build up a set of resources that parents really need to have access to in order to fully inform them before they start making um, decisions. Um, to those of us who have been in this field a long time, um, it seems dismaying to see the way that best practice seems to have gone out the door. We've gone backwards by about 10 years in a, in a rapid space of time. I think we can retrieve that situation. I think the partners play an important role. If I think about the way ahead, um, then um, I would say this. The NDIS is based upon the right principles. It's based upon participation, it's based upon empowerment, and it's got the right end in mind uh, that, the, uh, that what we want to end up with is an empowered adult able to make decisions about what their needs are and able to negotiate with services to get those needs met. That's um, an extraordinary um, and important vision and uh, I think to achieve that, we're going to do two main things. One of them is to build the child voice. I don't think the NDIS is currently, Peter referred to the fact that the NDIS um, made the mistake of um, applying thinking one size fits all. And I think the one size fits all is an adult model that's been used and we've got to put the child back in into this and think about what is the trajectory from being an infant through to being an adult and how do you progressively build the child voice in that story so that they can get there. What do we need to do? How do we design that? That's a piece of work which we collectively need to do. And the other thing we need to focus on, I think, is um, 
how um, how to build an integrated early childhood and NDIS system. Uh, the NDIS um, reboot that Peter has referred to um, is concerned about the fact that too many kids are getting into the NDIS, that they really should be able to be dealt with earlier in the system or through different parts of the system. And um, if that's going to happen, um, then the NDIS needs to work far more closely with the mainstream early childhood system. The early childhood system itself needs to build capacity for um, all children of all um, abilities. Um, that's another piece of work which we need to focus. I think if we focus on those two things, that will be part of what takes us forward. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Tim. Peter, are you still there? You're frozen on a on a frame for me, looking out the window in a very contemplative mood. Can you hear us? I can. Can you okay. hear us? Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. I think um thanks, Tim. I, I wrote down all of those things and saved it and I'll um and I'll send them out um as part of the recording. Um I think there's there's a couple of things here. I don't know if, we, and I know this is probably a controversial comment, but I'm in a controversial mood. Um, I don't think we've really done well talking about best practice as a whole anyway. We have in our states and territories, but um, nationally, I don't think the translation of what it actually, what we're actually talking about that makes sense for families has happened before the NDIS. We've tried to play catch up because we know we need it. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we're playing catch up when a scheme's rapidly rolling out. So that's that's one thing. I think the translation of best practice to everyday language um, is is something I think needs to be a priority. But Peter, I think one thing I wanted to send to you, a, a question I wanted to throw to you is something that's disturbed me over the last few months and definitely since doing the blueprint, uh, a term that I kept on hearing um, everywhere. And the initial, the initial vision of the partner approach was that there was a pathway that acknowledged that there's multiple pathways a family might take in order to seek support that they need. And that the partner was so ingrained in terms of in the community with relationships that you would hope that through one of those arms of the relationships, like an octopus's arms, they would be able to roll that family in in a supportive way to offer them the supports they need, whether that's NDIS plan or not. One of the terms that keeps on being used is that the pathway sounds more like a gateway now. And the term's actually being used, that we now have an ECEI gateway, which is an interesting term when we're talking about um, early childhood, a softer approach and a way of being inclusive for all families whilst the partner works out what their needs are and then subsequently supports them. Any comments on that, Peter, around how we got from some a, a beautiful vision to a gateway. Yes, Anna, it's uh, it truly is a, a you know a, 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 a travesty the language that sort of starts to find its way around sort of how a vision might be interpreted by someone who who is more focused on administering a scheme rather than the outcomes that Tim described. Uh, I would I would say to you three things in response to that. So the first one was. The vision always was that our partners in the community were well integrated and doing exactly what Tim described. They were, they were with the mainstream, they were meeting families where they were at, and they were supporting families both to go into the NDIS if required and go out of it. The vision always saw the scheme as being very porous for young children. By porous, I mean come in, come out. It's that administratively burdensome at the moment that, that people come in and it's like Hotel California. You can never leave. So there's this, sort of, there's this sort of really, really important piece of work that the agency and the partners need to do that really, really refocuses their efforts. And I know the agency is moving towards this and it, and it feels very, very slow, but I know they want very much to free the partners up from what they were burdened with through transition, which was very much the planning that, that, that sort of 
the access and planning decisions that, that has sort of, you know, really stolen the bulk of the resource and the bulk of the time. I think the second part, Anna, is the Turn Gateway really came out of, um, you know, probably the governance of the NDIA rather than the NDIA itself. So in other words, Tim alluded to the fact, and we've always got to be honest and talk about the elephant in the room, there were more children entering the scheme than uh, w what was originally envisaged. Now, there's many reasons for that, which I won't go into today, but you know, sim simply put, that is because the ECEI approach and design, which central to that is partners, was always envisaged about having a range of responses, not a one size fits all. And yet at the moment, for many mums and dads, the proposition is either access or nothing. And, and that's, that's a, that we've really created a, a, a very, very fraught sort of um, proposition. Um, so mums and dads, by the time they get to the partner are often pretty wound up and, and pretty clear about what they want and why they want it. So there's this concept that, you know, the, the vision really had the partners well integrated into the early childhood system and early health. And they were shaping those conversations. They were working with uh, maternal health nurses and paediatricians. They were, they, were, they were helping mum and dad along the right pathway rather than to a gateway. And I think the last part is that, um, you know, in the vision, we were really, really clear that we needed our partners to be system stewards. And by that, I mean, we acknowledge that um, every community, every region, every town has a different context in relation to its strengths, its, its you know, what it hasn't got and how it gets that, and indeed how, um, how you best work with, 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 you know, the market in, in creating all of the options that you need. So there was this key part of the vision that, that our, our partners were system stewards, they were collaborators. They were able to be what they needed to be in the context of the community and in the context of what was coming to their door in relation to the needs of children and families. And I think, you know, like so many, um, so many things that are at a national level, that tends to get tied up in, in process and in, in the sort of difficulties of the, the management of that rather than saying, look, we need to come up with a methodology here of partnering that allows our partners to be what they need to be and that we actually assist them to do that rather than tell them that they have to do A, B, C and D. So there is this very important journey if we're to go on if we're to get to the vision that, that Tim talked about, you know, that we, you know, we really want to see the whole of the child. We want to see high, level, high levels of collaboration we want to support the family, but most of all, we want the partners to be able to be the leaders of that and the decision makers of that. And, and we've got a bit of a way to go in our relationships with them. But the agency is, uh, I'm really actually quite optimistic because I'm seeing the agency starting to really embrace and understand that they need to do children very differently. Anna, I'd take, make one last little point on what uh, Tim said, and that is, um, what mums and dads want and value is, is a really important part for us to understand, particularly the partners. Um, I, I often have conversations with many of the partners and am concerned at the sort of, um, at the sorts of role they have to play from a point of view of what the market might, how the market might be behaving or other systems might be behaving in relation to what the expectations of the NDIS are. So there's also a very, a very important conversation we have about shaping those, shaping those sorts of opinions of what's valuable for mums and dads and how we best influence that. Because the partners will need help with it. Yeah, I, I mean, Definitely. Uh, thank you for, for your feedback, Peter. And I think um, knowing that we have 10 minutes to go, I think it would be helpful to sort of have um, maybe build on the discussion that Tim had. I think amazing points that both of you make around a, a way forward. One of the things that I, that I think is really confusing as well, though, for families is that, um, and, and for everyone really, is that the NDIS funding model 
um, exacerbates this belief that early child intervention is therapy. So I know that we talk about, um, you know, families need to understand best practice, families need to understand best practice, but there's this, there's this bigger piece that is actually an individualised funding model that says therapy rate is this, leads to the belief that early intervention is therapy, when early intervention is all of these other things that fall under an umbrella. And we've had to fight and fight and fight for some of those things within the umbrella to be included within the NDIS, but a lot of it still isn't. Um, and so an element of that has been sort of handed over and is being stewarded by the partner model. Um, but until there's other ways, I think until there's a clear guidebook or a framing and around um, support to do the other things under the umbrella, um, I'm worried about this, how we will move away from that belief. Um, and then that's the driving force behind if early child intervention is therapy, then I need therapy for my child. Sorry, Tim, did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, this is a real problem. Obviously, that's what's, what we've seen happen. Um, the, um, uh, but that's because, and it is the way that things are funded at the moment. There are perverse incentives for people to provide, um, for service providers to offer um, therapy. And, and that, um, you know, a funding model the way that things are funded um, can fundamentally change um, the way that services are provided. That's the message from what's happened with the, uh, with the NDIS um, and the funding model and the, the processes need to be modified in order to, um, to achieve the, the ends. The, um, so what I was suggesting before, that, that the partners in, in the current circumstances need to do everything they can to try and um, put the parents in um, a situation where they can make an informed choice uh, that doesn't automatically think in terms of therapy as the answer. Um, that, that's, on, um, that's only part of what needs to happen. The other part of what needs to happen is that the, the actual funding model, what gets funded, how it gets funded, how it's all conceptualised, needs to be revised. Um, now, Peter has spoken of being optimistic about the NDIA um, intending to grapple with those. Um, Peter, I don't know whether you were going to mention the fact that the NDIA actually has a tender out at the moment seeking a partner to help reconfigure the early childhood um, system. And the tender clearly indicates what Peter was saying, that the NDIA has taken on board the fact that despite the best intentions of the scheme, the way it's running at the moment is not achieving its goal. So what the NDIA wants is to find ways of operationalizing best practice, of designing a system that will in fact not provide perverse incentives, but provide positive incentives to, um, uh, to deliver best practice. Um, so I think that, um, uh, that is a, a very promising thing, but I think that it's the combination of what the partners can do to um, communicate to inform parents of, of what their options are in a complete way and what the NDIA can do to configure a system that will push people, nudge people, as it were, in the direction um, of making choices that are going to be in their child and family's best interests. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Peter? Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I dropped out there for a while, so I've rejoined. Um, I got the gist, I think, of Tim, of what you're saying, and um, I go back to my sort of opening statement of the sort of in our first observation of the NDIA falling into the rookie trap of 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 one size fits all. So, you know, some of the perverse incentives comes come from um, the way we've set up the adult centric scheme with a price guide that rewards. A whole range of you know, a whole range of sort of bizarre and perverse behaviours, and 
I was just commenting to someone yesterday on the phone that some, sometimes I think the NDIS has not turned into a market of services, it's turned into a marketers of services. Those that market to the hardest, um, you know, get the biggest bite of the pie. I, I would say my optimism is for many reasons. One is we are doing a strategy reset. Um, I'm, there'll, be more, there'll be more said about that in the coming months. But that really does look at those, those, those issues and those opportunities that Tim's outlined. And I think out of the other part is, is, you know, getting back to your sort of concept of the gateway was that the vision always was that the NDIS was more than individual funded supports. It was about the NDIS responding in many, many ways. And, and that often the individualised support option wasn't the best one that we needed to have a range of funding mechanisms and support mechanisms to the market that allowed them, and particularly through the partners, that allowed them to respond appropriately. Um, that all or nothing proposition I've talked about, it's a, it's a key feature that, that constantly pains me to see mums and dads fighting real hard for as much as they can get because we've set up a, a, an NDIS in the early childhood world that is you either get in or you get nothing. And that's, that's, that's the biggest driver I can see. My, my other sort of comment, Tim, to your insights there would be that the partners shape the conversations, but we need to assist them with that. I think, you know, there's, there's more, there's more uh, work for the agency to focus on that, that certainly starts to work with health, work with early education and marshal the like-minded systems that want to promote better practice rather than large packages. And, and there is this sort of disconnectivity that I grieve about constantly in the NDIS that it's almost a parallel universe, Anna. It's, it's, become, it's become not integrated and actually quite segregated. And our partners are going to have to help us really bridge that bridge that sort of gap that's, that, that's appeared unintentionally, but in a fairly rapid way. So, you know, that's a lot of challenges to put at the partner's feet. And one of the more, one of the more sort of uh, helpful observations I'd make is that the tune review report and, and the government's response will be out soon. And there's, there's certainly a little bit in that 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 allows us to rethink planning for families and maybe takes a lot of pressure off our partners and moves planning into, you know, into a place that it should be. And that is the family choosing where the real planning happens. And I know from all my experience, real planning happens with the person that's delivering the best practice early childhood intervention. The partner needs to really focus on just, um, assisting people on that journey and then being the quality, uh, the, the quality role in that, not having to, uh, you know, be burdened with the huge amounts of administration they currently have to cover over. So my optimism is around saying there is change coming. It probably won't come quick enough for many, but um, it's, it's heading in the right direction. And I that... Think, that um... Yeah, no, away you go. Yep. Oh, no, I was just going to say, we've got a couple of minutes left, so maybe if we just leave with some sort of, I mean, you're sort of getting there, Peter, in terms of what the agency's doing, um, which I think is a great thing. I mean, we were all, I mean, I'm still in love with the NDIS legislation. I think it's the best human rights legislation we have. Um, how we're moving towards the social model of disability away from deficit and diagnosis, I'm not too sure how that's going with the current, processes but I think that there's definitely um, things happening and, and wonderful people working behind the scenes um, I guess just for those on the on the audience now that are partners if there's any sort of Tim you gave an amazing recap around what partners can do and some direction and and tips um, for moving forward um, I just wanted to I guess leave on a note Peter, from what you were talking about before with this integrated service and, and support, which Tim talked about as well. It's as if the NDIS sort of came and sort of as a triangle popped itself onto the existing um, system in Australia of early childhood supports and has tried to, in a way, infiltrate to be that top tier of specialist supports. And I think the partner model tried its hardest to sort of pull that triangle together and make it more integrated 
Um, but I'm, I'm mindful that in order to get to a fully integrated, um, holistic and mainly responsive early intervention system in Australia, um, that we need a few things that aren't happening um, on all levels. And I think one of those is trust. I think trust between the agency and the partners and trust between partners and the early childhood sector as well. Um, and I think that differs between um, each area, but I think trust and relationships are, are key. And another thing I think is um, the, the relationships that can happen across partners. And I know the NDIA do a, you know, link up partners, et cetera, but more opportunities for cross-pollination and mentoring and supports between partners who are all delivering something similar, even though it's different in each area, I think mm. really needs to be promoted. I know that I have conversations with multiple partners and try and link people up, um, but everyone's on a different stage of their rollout journey of being a partner and are experiencing different things. And it's a hard ask to be up against the contract with the KPIs and still as an organisation stick to your community vision. Um, so I think some more opportunities to do that and connect, particularly with new people that are emerging as partners, um, I think is really important moving forward. Tim, any comments? Oh, no, I agree with that. Um, uh, but the you know the big thing I think is it has to do with the the linkage with mainstream services. If we're going to fulfil the vision that Peter was talking about, that that the um, the NDIS offers different options, we have to be able to trust. Parents have to be able to trust the mainstream system, the the other parts of the triangle to be able to meet their children's needs. And at the moment, those options are, are simply not there, which is why people are grabbing at the NDIS money, which is unfortunate. Mm. Thanks, Tim. Peter, any final comments from you? Uh, look, I'd support both of that. And I, I just brought up a document on my computer about the role of partners as they were envisaged way back at the start. and. There's nothing in there about planning other than a small dot point at the bottom. It was about everything that you're describing, building the capacity and support for the family, the carer, you know, linking to information networks and working with mainstream to be more accessible, you know, doing the mentoring and the support, the professional support that works so well when you've got a collaborative system at a local regional level, you know, building sort of that whole that whole concept that the NDIS is connected, it's connected into the real world, not some, some office at the end of a street that you go to when your child's got additional needs and, and you, 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 get into a, you get into a conversation about how much and how quick rather than what is best for the child and the family. And the last part was that the NDIS, the, the, the NDIS partners, early child intervention partners were connected. They were a national network supporting one another that were where necessary, mentoring, sharing resources, helping one another, but also helping the sector, helping the sector where there was gaps, et cetera, et cetera. So they were able to be many things rather than just what unfortunately they've become thus far. I think my last comment, I think my last comment, Anna, would be that the partners are really important in this. We, we identified early that as states and territories left this system, a lot of the industry sector leaders were, were you know, going to find their way into the new world, but that didn't necessarily mean that we had, we had them in, a, in places of, of, of enough influence and enough sort of, um, you know, enough sort of ability to, to make decisions for a very complex system. So my sort of, um, my, my vision and my message today is I need to redouble my efforts to ensure that the partners become very strong leaders in this space and are not, not consigned to, as you point, pointed out, KPIs and, and, and contracts rather than the, the vision, deliver, the deliverers and stewards of the vision. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, we have to finish up now, but a, f a few people have talked about um, families who are framed as disadvantaged families or vulnerable families or families that are not engaged. Just one comment on that. Um, you may be an ECEI partner and a partner to um, the NDIA and a partner in, in many ways, but the reframing of the question is who is the partner of the family? 
And there are many organisations, um, many local groups, many community groups that are the partners of, of families who are disadvantaged um, or are not engaged and building relationships there. And I think that's what Peter means by meeting the families where they're at. Um, you don't have to build up whole new relationships and try and engage families that haven't engaged with the service before, um, and particularly being a government um, system, um, that might be a really hard ask. However, building relationships and which is through consistency, continuously going to the same places you're going to do, going, following through with the things you're going, that you say you're going to do and spending time doing community engagement is how you engage, engage families that aren't connected because you work through um, the supports and services that they already have the trust with rather than building that anew. Um, so that would be my, my final words on working with, with families that are disengaged is go to where they're at. Tim, any, anything on that? No, I think that's, we do need to start with um, where they're at, but, um, but the system needs to support you doing that. Absolutely. Um, okay, we have to head back to the main stage now. Um, so I just wanted to thank you both. Um, always inspiring to talk to you and um, thank you to the 131 beautiful people that have joined us this afternoon to have a chat. Um, I wish we had longer. I think we could speak about this for days, um, but I look forward to seeing where the agency goes with this, with the refresh of the partner model. Um, and I will share every, I'll share all the, um, the wisdom of Tim. Um, I wrote it down on the whiteboard. So I'll share that around what we really need to do moving forward. So thank you.